there was a lot going on there before that. You know, there was uh, there were missions going on. There was an American presence there. There the Mew, the Marine yep. Mew was going in and doing stuff. So can you tell us what what brought you guys to even be in that location and then kind of I guess we can work through the whole op. Yeah, they wanted us to start detaining um leaders of Adid's high hierarchy um to try to bring him to a position of negotiating. Right. I mean, he's stealing food. We're we're sending food over to feed people and he's stealing it and using it as a starvation as a as a tactic. And so, you know, negotiations were failing. We we had been rehearsing for it for a while and it, it actually changed hands from squadron to squadron to ranger, you know, bat to ranger bat. And so we picked it up and started rehearsing for it, and it just happened to go down on our watch. But it was over time, like, all right, let's try to negotiate. Let's try to get him to stop, you know, like they do, politics, try to get him to stop, and then reach out and smack the dude and come back and say, hey, now, now you want to talk again? But we we had decided, okay, I think when they had, um, what, attacked the Marines and then maybe some Kenyans, it was like, okay, load up. We're going to go over, and we're going to start rolling up some of his leaders to to bring him to the table. And we just kept started rolling people up. And, um, you know, that still wasn't working, still wasn't working until the final three October hit. We killed so many and did so much damage that, okay, now we'll come talk. But rolling people up before that wasn't working. I don't know if we were getting the right people and it takes time to work your way down that list. But a deed was hidden pretty well. Um, we caught auto before the third. Um, that might have yielded some extra stuff at, at a young age then. I wasn't you know, privy to all the intel. I mean, mm-hmm. I probably could have dug around and figured it out, but I was the guy that like put me on the helicopter and said, go, man, let's just do this. You know, I was yeah. the young guy. I was a young guy waiting to kick in the door and shoot you in the face and, and then go back home and work out some more. But that was, we went to go start rolling up the leaders um, and in hopes of bringing them back to the table. Were those pretty straightforward missions, you know, at first? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think our first mission was a, was a dirty UN compound, which we didn't know about it. I remember going in and um, doing the hit. And I remember I was the first guy down the stairs from the, from the roof and I got caught up in all of the, the antenna wires and shit. And I had a shotgun, 1100 shotgun for God's sake. And I rope off the helicopter. I'm running and I'm, I go down the stairs and I'm halfway down the stairs to the next level. And I'm caught in wires. I can't go any further. I'm like, ah, I'm trapped. I'm start fighting through these wires and cutting and breaking. I finally get around the corner and out pops this dude on the second floor in a door. And I'm like, oh shit. Of course I was never trained to do this, but I scream freeze motherfucker or die. (laughs) Never trained to do that. He just took off running back in his room. And I thought, well, that didn't work. You know? Shit. So my team, my team pulls up behind me and I got my, my 1100, you know, with a, with slugs in it aimed right at the door. And I thought, well, I'll just aim a little bit to the right and shoot him. If I see an AK come out the door. And the team leader pulls up behind me. He's like, what you got? And I go, somebody just ran into the room in the right. He, they bypassed me like always, oh, like, like planned and went to the door in the right, you know, and I, I transitioned over to pull security on the door on the left and they went in there and I thought, fuck it. I took off and I went in the door on the left by myself and started clearing the room all by myself. My team leader's chasing me through two rooms and finally gets a hold of me. He's like, stop, you're doing it wrong. I'm like, all right, I'm all jacked up. I was all excited. And then finally we took the house down and started, um, doing the SSC people bringing out satellite dishes. Hey, 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 to ask the team. What do I do with this? What is it? He goes, I don't know, but it looks big and expensive. He's like, smash it. Started smashing shit. Then we found out it was like a dirty compound that the UN people were stealing shit. And it was like, okay, well, I guess we had a good confidence target on our first. Yeah, hit. for sure. <laughs> it was That's funny. It was scary. Cause you don't know. Um, but then after that, it started heating up, you know, the missions would get a little more heated, but, still nothing like you think, you know? Yeah. Can you, before we get into, you know, October 3rd and stuff, can you talk about like the atmospherics of the city and maybe kind of give people a understanding of just kind of what the vibe was like, because this isn't a normal American city where you're going in and raiding, you know, the, this area is controlled by warlords. There's like open gun markets. There's like, you know, this isn't a normal place. Everybody's got a gun. Um, and you don't know who's friendly or not. And there's a, there's a, there was like a demarcation line in the city. Um, one of the roads, I don't know, something September road. I don't remember the name of it where on this side was the good clan. They liked us. And on this side was the bad clan that didn't like us. So, and if if you didn't know those areas, you know, you're pointing a gun at somebody all the time. You you just don't know anyway. So we only did a one vehicle, you know, radio mode was a vehicle hit. Everything else was flying by helos. So you're kind of just staring down and all the roads are dirt. 
it's like what you would think Africa would be when most of Africa is really not like that. But mm -hmm. it's like what people think Africa of, oh, dirt roads and cactuses. Yeah. That was Somalia, dirt roads and cactuses. And, and you're doing hits on these houses and you're trying to run around the house at the back door and there's, there's cactus everywhere and you run right into it. You're on a hit. You don't want to die and get shot. And now your legs are full of needles, right? There's a lot of shit to think about. Uh, you, you, your, your hands are stuck to your pants as you're trying to get these cactuses off. You know, oh, by the way, you got to go in that door and, and take people down and hopefully they don't kill you. So things like that, the, it, the city wasn't laid out like a normal city. The people don't care. They're used to guns, man. You, in America, you point a gun at somebody, ah, they take off running. You point a gun at somebody in Somalia, they're like, what? <laughs> what, what do you want? I don't know what you're doing. You know, they don't, they, they're not afraid of being... Uh, pointed you know having a gun pointed at him so that threatening maneuver that americans think oh, i'll pull a, point a gun at you and you'll do what i want they don't care you point a gun at them you're either going to shoot them or not and they know that and they, they they're not afraid of the weapon being pointed at them and so it's a different environment to learn there that your threats don't matter you got to manhandle if you can't talk to them you got to manhandle um and be direct about what you want to do but when you when you try to consider the world as america's society people are like oh just get those terrorists over here and let them go to walmart they'll love america i'm like they hate you because of walmart man mm -hmm. they hate you because you have too much they're, they're jealous it's religion whatever it is they they don't like you and walmart's not going to make it better living like an american doesn't make them like you more right so realizing that our way of life is way different and way better and way easier than most people and they're envious and they don't they don't appreciate us coming in and trying to force things on them and it was uh it was it was eye-opening to learn that you can't scare people into doing what you want you know mm -hmm. they don't care women walking down the street pointing out your position in the middle of a firefight just point you out they won't shoot me i'm a woman you know and i'm not armed i'm like well how do you know the other guys won't shoot you because they're not very good at shooting you know it's uh and you'd see that a lot. People would come out and try to walk down the street like they're going to the market in the middle of a firefight. And I'm like, they just don't give a shit. They That's really wild. don't. They're either that dumb and deaf or they just don't care about life like we do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird reality in a lot of like third world countries is that they just don't look at life the way that we do. They've you grown know? up. They've grown up in a hell of a world, man. Yeah, a lot to, of them, them don't expect to, them to make it to 30. Yeah, to them, dying's better. Uh, heaven's better. It's 72 virgins or whatever it is. It's better than this shit I live in. And 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 how we live now in America, most most people, sure, we're, we got people that live like shit too. Um, For sure. But I don't hear them complaining. I, I, they're not the ones on, on social complaining. The ones on social complaining are complaining from their five-star hotels. You know, eh, this sucks. My bag of gold is so heavy. It's like... <laughs> I know, I got you. I got I'm in you. San Diego, and homeless people will literally, if you're like, they'll come up to you and be like, "Yeah, oh, you got any change or whatever?" You're like, "Nah, sorry, man, I don't, you know, I don't have my wallet. I don't carry any money or whatever." They're like, "That's cool, I got Venmo." You know, they have the digital. Right. I'm like, what? right. What are you right. doing? Yeah. How about you Venmo me some money, bro? You know, it's so crazy. It. Yeah. Our our poor and homeless are way better off than <laughs> the poor and homeless in a lot of countries. It's so crazy yeah. like that. Yeah, man. So. You know, for these kind of ops, when you're running into these, you said you were carrying a shotgun. Is that what you normally carried? No. Uh, uh, you know what, man? <laughs> I go back and look at that. I, I'm like, what the fuck? I, uh, it was an 1100 long automatic. And if you didn't clean it, it didn't work well. But it was one of those I had. I had slugs. I had bean bags, And I had buckshot all over my, my shit. And I knew where it was. And I carried that because I was the breacher. And I thought, Phew. There's enough guns, right? I mean, I'm surrounded by Delta guys with guns and I'm the breacher. So I'll just, that's my primary. And if I need to use it as a weapon, I'll use it as a weapon. I wasn't thinking, and I don't know why anybody didn't stop me. <laughs> I, I use that for the first five missions. And I, and I, for some reason I changed before three October, I switched and I got a shorty shotgun and I went back to my M4. Thank God. Um, it's probably a God thing that I switched because there was no other reason I switched. Um, other than I might've been getting tired of carrying that thing and it, and it didn't always Dude, I had to keep it spotless. Mm -hmm. And so I went with a shorty um, shotgun and carried my M4 and a pistol. But I don't know why I did it. I did it because there was a lot of um, non-combatants. And I thought, I'll be the guy that can shoot bean bags at people. By the way, they don't give a shit. You hit, you know, I hit a couple of people in the face with bean bags. They took off running. But others, man, I don't give a shit. And so if they're there to do business, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd spent more time changing rounds out and trying to figure out what to go. So I got rid of that just before the third, thankfully. 
It was just a, a new guy thought process. Like, hey, let's try this out. I mean, I get the, I understand your thought process about it. Like, hey, there's all these dudes have guns. I'll breach with this. And then I have these other capabilities if required. Yeah. You know, and, and that's not a bad thing to be like, hey, I'm going to shoot this dude with a beanbag rather than put a slug at him, you know, because they yeah. may not be doing anything wrong. I mean, you have your own reasons for why you shot him, but I mean, you want to talk about those actually, you know, why, yeah. what was a reason that you'd put a beanbag into somebody? I, uh, if they're like, if I need to get them, if they're directing traffic or if they're in the middle of a firefight and I think that that's unsafe for them as well. Um, I, I or if they're keep approaching and I keep telling them to stop and they won't stop, they're either going to get killed by somebody soon, or I can hit them with a the beanbag around and maybe they'll determine that I don't want them to keep coming. Um, but one, it's hard to hit people with a beanbag around, especially from a helicopter. And, and I had a magic shot one time. that was pretty cool. Um, he ended up being a, no, that was a different dude. But yeah, I, I three turns in the helicopter. I, I'd shoot the beanbag, and you'd see it go, and just miss. And there's three guys in a group looking up, and I'm just kept trying to disperse them. And I'd shoot again, and it'd get a little closer. And it's all Kentucky windage, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no, there's no way to aim a beanbag with helicopters flying in a circle. And then I, I the third time around, I shot it, and it was just arcing, and I could see, it and it just hit him right in the face <laughs> and his feet flew out from under him and he hit the ground his two friends looked down and took off running he jumped up and took off running I'm like that's what it took just to get him to go you know but just to get guys out of there but i'd, I'd put two or three beanbag rounds and then i'd follow it up with a couple slugs you know um or beanbags buckshot and then a slug because i couldn't get distance with anything but the slug the rifled slug so mm -hmm. if beanbags didn't work or if they were if it was a real threat i could pump those out real quick and then go to the you know, the buckshot if I had to, or the slugs, I could easily shoot four or five of those rounds in no time and uh, pick the one I needed for that person. But, it, it, you know, after about five hits, I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> this I could do this better. Yeah. Yeah, that does make more – I mean, if you're only really only using it for breaching, like that's really the best option for the shotgun, it does make more sense to have like a shorty that you can throw on your back, pull it out real quick, fire, you know, and then move back to your M4, back to your main weapon. Yeah. What, okay, let's talk about October 3rd. Was that a, you know, was this raid a normal mission at the time? Was it, did it feel like everything, you know, up into that point, the planning and the prepping, was it all just kind of what you've been doing since you'd been there or was there anything different about it? Uh, it was, uh, it was, again, it was a blowout hit, but we had a guy on the ground um, that was looking for the meeting. You know, and if the meeting was going to go, if the meeting was happening, he would raise his hood. His beacon was on top of the car. He would raise the hood. And so the leaders were watching that. I, I'd gone out for a five-mile run with a friend of mine, and they were playing volleyball and shit. Um, but some of the leaders were watching what was happening. Now, whether we thought it was going to go down or not, I don't know. Or why, why would I have gone on a five-mile run? You know, it's not doesn't make sense. So I don't think we expected it. But when he happened to pop the hood up, like indicating they're here. It was one of those beep, beep, beepers go off, turn around, run back. Shit, get my shit on. I'm dehydrated, you know, and I leave all the odds, grab one bottle of water, and throw it in my, my hip pocket, and, you know, there we go. And we launched with Irene, Irene, Irene. We launched, and um, I had no idea. They run to the helicopter with a little drawing. And I go, okay, whatever. I couldn't hear a word you just said, but when we hit the ground, I'll figure it out, right? I'll shoot bad guys, and but we, we got inserted into the wrong spot just due to brownout, due to people shooting, uh, RPGs were instant. It was near the Bacara market where all the black market shit was. So it was one of those instant, we're under fire. So before my helicopter even pulled up to drop ropes, um, they couldn't get into the target area. So they inserted us outside of the ranger perimeter. And we were way under fire at the time. And we'd already had heard Blackburn had fallen and they were trying to get vehicles in to get him out. And so we had to take down a house just to get off the street I did that, figured out where we were going, and then worked our way into the perimeter without getting shot by the Rangers. <laughs> Everybody's nervous. Mm -hmm. And then made it in, and by then the hit was already down, but we they took turned over the detainees to us, the, whatever, they're 10 or 12 detainees, and we took tar, uh, uh, charge of them and started searching the building. And then passed them off, loaded them up on the five-ton, and, and um, we started to prepare for exfil. And that's when I heard the helicopter above us get shot. You know, and I looked up and saw it spinning, you know, off to the northeast, and I thought, oh, shit, that's different. All right, that's that's bad. We already known that some had gotten hit, but I saw this one right above us, and I knew it was going down. So the plans start changing immediately. And then the, the, the volume of fire picked up, too, and there was a ranger leaning against a gate, a metal gate, um, 
just with his back to it, taking a break, and his neck just pff, explodes. You know, he just got shot through the gate. I was like, fuck, this is picking up, you know? So after that, they made the plan. We started moving down the street, you know, on both sides of the road towards the crash site. Had to head east first and then turn north. And um, as we were heading east, every time we passed the intersection, there was, I don't know how many, hundreds of Somalians paralleling us, shooting at us, trying to get to the helicopter too, right? We're like, we got to get there first, you know? And they're already a block north of us. And so we had to fight our way through that. Um, and that's when, as soon as we turned to go north, the volume of fire picked up. My side of the street was more shaded. And the opposite side of the street was a little bit lit up from the sun. And that's the side of the street Earl was on. And he got shot in the face and died instantly, which I didn't know till later. I saw them dragging him away. Um, but I didn't. I, I, Earl's wounded. Somebody's wounded. You know, and it was one of those. Oh, find out later he was instantly killed. But that was about a block and a half from the crash site. We just fought our way up the street. Took down a couple of houses near the crash site, and the rest of the the uh, the rest of the element was behind us. All the rangers, the wounded rangers, and and a couple other Delta teams were behind us. So, my team and another team was the furthest north of the movement, right where the crash site was. So we were like right at the site, and it just that just started the night of pounding. It just they just kept coming. It was uh, we were trapped, right? Couldn't get out. People couldn't get in. We ran out of ammo. I know I ran out of ammo once. Um, Ran out of water because we didn't bring water. And it just it, it just kept going to where it starts turning into night. And you're like, God, man, what? okay. Huh. I was making jokes about getting home for dinner, you know? And now I'm not making jokes anymore. Now I'm asking my team leader, like, hey, are they going to make it? Like, you can hear the convoy in a big firefight the entire night. I'm like, are they going to make it? And he's like, I don't know. And he took off to go do something else. I'm like, shit, dude. That's where you're supposed to motivate me. You're supposed to tell me something <laughs> cool that motivates me, not like the truth. And so that they just started picking our house apart um, all night. RPGs, blowing the walls down, creeping up on us. I mean, I, it was nonstop to where I got to the point of, well, I'm going to die. You know, I'm, I, this is it. This, this is it. So let's just do this. Um, let's just do as much damage as we can until that moment. You know, I was no longer afraid after I kind of relented, I think, that I'm going to die tonight. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to fuck some shit up. You know, that, that young kid, like, ah, let's go down breaking shit. So that's it. And that made me feel better. It kind of calmed me. And uh, the rest of the night was just doing business. And uh, I remember seeing the 10th Mountain show up. <laughs> A group of people walking on both sides of the road with two Pakistani armored vehicles, you know, the BMPs. Uh, the only things that made it. And I was mm -hmm. like, holy shit, there's a bunch of army dudes walking up the road, man. All right. And a 10th Mountain dude walks in, a black dude. He comes walking. He's like, Anybody got any Copenhagen? I'm like, fuck, dude, really? After all that, you're looking for Copenhagen. You just left the base, and you don't have Copenhagen. <laughs> That's funny. Fucking bum. You know, we were going to ask you for <laughs> Copenhagen. <laughs> That's what we really need. <laughs> That's what we needed was Copenhagen and water. Oh, That's by what's the way, driving boy. this fight. <laughs> but I thought it was unique that he came in and asked for Copenhagen. I'm like, God, he doesn't know what's going on, does he? Man. And all these, all these 10th Mountain guys were wandering around the streets. I'm like, don't do it. Don't don't do it. And then all of a sudden a little bird came over and was lighting up some people up on the next street. And all that brass was falling everywhere. And they started screaming, ah, what's that runner fire? And I go, That's brass, bro. It's been happening all night. You just got to keep your head on a swivel. But they were out in the street like they owned it. And I'm like, you don't own it. But maybe they did with volume. We don't, you know, we don't have volume. So mm -hmm. when you get surrounded in a unit like us, you don't have the volume. You're like a mean small hornet's nest. You're gonna sting a lot of people, but eventually your nest is gonna get crushed, you know, if there's enough people. Until you have volume like the 10th mountain. And then that kind of makes people think differently. You know, even though they might not be as highly trained or as accurate, there's more of them. And that's that's a scarier yeah. thing. And those armored vehicles pose, a, you know, they're not. That changes your mind, man. That yeah. changes your mind. You don't drive up in a truck anymore, you know, like they were driving up in trucks with machine guns. Once you see an armored vehicle. And when we ran the Moog Mile after that, it was one of those turn the corner and, and you see where everything was parked. There were tanks. I'd never seen tanks shooting, you know, like that. There was a tank we run up on it. Boom! Shot. I was like, holy fuck, he shot right into the city. Like, well, no shit. What, what is he shooting at? It was just shooting into houses of people shooting. I'm like, this is crazy. And the and the the packy vehicles were there and they were shooting in all directions. And the 10th Mountain were shooting from their Humvees and shit. Just in 360, just shooting at everybody. And uh, we hopped in the back of a Hummer and took off and got separated from the, everybody else who we went to the Pakistani stadium, which was close. Our two Humvees got lost. 
And so we drove all the way back to the port and then all the way back to the back gate of the airfield under fire most of the time until, until we crossed that little line where the good people, you know, were there. Mm -hmm. And then somebody's like, hey, 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 we're in the friendly side. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, all right, just keep an eye on them. But it was one of those, um, when will this end, you know? And yeah. we went in the back gate of the airfield and we stopped waiting on other people to pull in. And nobody came. And our radios were dead because they were, you know, they died early in the night. And so it was one of those, I have no idea what's going on. Nobody else followed us. And we're the only two Humvees here. Where's, is everybody dead? What, I mean, what happened? Do we go back? Do we? So we drove around the airfield, pulled into the hangar, and there was, I saw probably 10 bodies lined up on the ground, covered in uh, ponchos and whatnot. And I could see their boots. And I, I could see Adidas assault boots. And then I could see jungle boots. And I thought, oh, man. There's there's Delta guys mixed in with the Rangers there. And I, and I don't know who or what part of the night or where from, you know, and then pull into the compound and there's Humvees and there's blood and sand and the smell of bleach everywhere where they were cleaning the vehicles out to send them back out to try to get us again. And it was one of those smells I'll never forget of the, the morning sun coming up, heating up the, the bleach and the sand and the blood. And I was like, oh, I'll never forget that. And then finally started getting word of they're at the Packy stadium. They're going to load into vehicles and they'll be flying them back. And then the helicopter started coming back and landing with guys on it, getting out and figuring out who was where and who was what and who was missing, you know? And that's when we started getting word that who was dead and, and, and how many people were missing. And, and it was like, shit, man. What a you know, day, man. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a long 18 hours that was. Yeah. Were you guys ever resupplied with ammo? Was there ever any kind of, uh, so you did get yeah. ammo. How much did you go in with? Uh, 210 rounds, man. My basic load. You know, everybody had a basic load, um, plus whatever shotgun rounds I had and, and pistols um, and a couple of grenades, you know. And then um, out of ammo. And they, they finally resupplied us in the night. I don't know what time it was. We're out of water. They kicked out. Bought, we didn't have a prepackaged resupply, right? N another lesson learned, right? We, we, we don't go out that long. We don't need a resupply. Mm-hmm. Something other units think about all the time, you know, prepackaged, delivered, ready to go. Fucking idiots, right? So we didn't have it. They're throwing out ammo boxes and it's exploding on the ground. And I'm out there scooping up bullets and shit. And, and the water jugs, five gallon water jugs being thrown out of helicopters, bottles of water blowing up on the ground. I'm like carrying water jugs across the street to give to the other teams and shit. And, and it was like, this is a bad idea. We, we didn't, that resupply didn't go too well because it hovered right above our building, just above one story level. And it took fire from the building next to us from the second floor. Mm -hmm. And that's when one of my friends got shot in the face, um, resupplying us at eye level from a second floor window that was right next door to us. I'm like, I didn't know there was anybody up there. Why, you know, so we need to go kill that dude. You know, it's, it's that guy was there the whole time or, or just luckily ran up that and, and started shooting at the helicopter during the supply. So they took off. And, and thankfully, I mean, I mean, that kept us the rest of the night. But then again, in the morning, I was out. I was picking up magazines on the ground and knocking dirt out on my helmet and sticking it. And, you know, there's three rounds left in that one. And I'd shoot it through like windows or in directions of people shooting at us and then find more magazines and load them back up and shoot more ammo. But, um, learned a big lesson then. Did it ever feel like you guys had a handle, like you guys were getting a handle on the situation? Like, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like you, the way you're making it sound is like you're all in this one building and there's really nothing you can do. You can't go out to do anything because if you do, you're going to get shot. People can't get to you because there's, you know, all, obviously ongoing issues throughout the city and stuff like that. I mean, what was your purpose? I mean, I'm trying to figure out before before the operation, was this a contingency that you guys had considered, had planned for? Uh, you know, were you guys going through SOPs that you had already, you know, we hey, if a helicopter goes down, then we're going to move and try to, set, you know, can you yep. kind of walk us through that? Because it's like, I, I, I don't want it to, I'd hate for it to come off. Like you guys are just sitting in a house and hoping to be rescued while occasionally having to take people out. It, but was it like that? Or was there more, did it feel more offensive when you were there? Nope. We were, I felt like we were on a fire base being overrun, right? Yeah. Here we are a small element in the middle of their city surrounded. Mm -hmm. Our reinforcements can't get to us. The only things keeping back the thousands of people that were coming, at least by the radio conversations, are, hey, there's truckloads coming. They're picking more people up. Once they entered that area, the little birds would just fillet them. I mean, honestly, just destroying. The little birds kept people at bay, mostly. And we had, we had practiced before that. The helos going down and the sar bird coming in, which is exactly what happened. 
but we didn't practice two birds going down. We didn't, you know, I mean, we, we, how far do you rehearse? You know, you only have so many men. And so I felt I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. I felt that we were not in control. We were maintaining um, a bit of our, our space, but they were slowly picking it away. And had it not been for the little birds, we probably maybe would have been overrun. Um, but the little birds kept them away and the 10th mountain finally got there with, with the numbers and the packy vehicles. It took a long time to get those people together. But yeah, to me, it felt like, and I, now I'm a young guy, right? I wasn't getting all the messages on the radios. I'm just doing my thing, but I didn't, I didn't see anything that appeared to be like we were in control. We were in defensive mode the entire night to keep them from overrunning us. And we were there to protect the bodies of the pilots that were buried underneath the crash site before we could get them out and take the bodies back. So it was one of those, we're here now because these bodies can't be retrieved quickly. And we couldn't retrieve them until that packy vehicle got there and we hooked the chain and pulled the, the helicopter frame off of two of the pilots bodies and got their, their parts out and, you know, re recovered them and, and br be able to bring them back. Yeah. You know, in, in a moment like this, you know, you obviously you said you're not receiving all the information and stuff like that. Had you guys heard that one of the American bodies had been dragged through the streets and stuff? Was this something that you had known about yet? No, man, that was a, that was a painful realization the next morning when everybody started getting back and somebody had turned on the TV and it started making the news. Yeah. When we saw that on the news, that was, um, I think the orders came out that we weren't going back out. <laughs> I don't know that we could, we were decimated. We we're waiting on another squadron to show up, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of anger and I don't think they would have let us go just due to the retaliatory issues you might have under emotions. Um, For sure. So, yeah, it was one of those. We saw it on the news ourselves. Uh, that was our first intel report of that was watching it happen on the news in our own hangar and not knowing who it was really at first and freaking out and getting upset and then getting all the reports of who's missing and and what we're going to do about it. So, yeah, it was uh, that was some devastating times to see that happen. Yeah. I mean, how could it not be? Right. You yeah. know, and I can understand the anger, obviously. Um, and I can also understand the command going, maybe we sh shouldn't send these guys out yet. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like we were killing people, but we weren't filleting and just, dis dis you know, desecrating bodies and doing horrible things. And then when somebody does that, that, that brings out a whole nother human being in you, you know? Yeah. It's a horrific part of it. And you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a part of that, that whole situation that doesn't really get, I don't think it gets talked about a lot, you know, like that's a, I don't know. It's such a. It, you always see that it's you always see this that kind of stuff in these in these wild countries, you know, kind of like the contractors hung off the bridge in Iraq and stuff like yeah. that. It's like um, I don't know why some of these nations, like the people in them, do that kind of thing, but I, I think don't know. it's a it's a fear tactic of uh, back in the day, cut heads off, right? Some people still cut heads off. It's terrifying. You cut a head off. I mean, Americans have raised, they remove killing from our families mostly. It's it's hidden behind buildings, the slaughtering of even animals. Um, mm -hmm. We don't even kill our own people when they murder a whole school full of kids. Like, well, life in prison, you know, I don't want to kill you. It's like, man, other people don't have that. Other kids, other countries don't grow up with that. Um, they don't get the luxury in that way, right? Kids grow up three, four years old. You're out, you're out chasing chickens and herding sheep because they need you, and by the way, just suck it up and do it. And so they don't hold life dear like we do. Uh, they don't mind cutting things up and cutting things off of, of bodies or used to it. You know, they slaughter their own food and eat it. Uh, we're, we're like, I don't even like to cut bologna, man. It's gross. <sighs> so yeah, our society is a lot different and that's a good fear tactic to use on us. You know, they're always so bolsterous. The valley will run red with your blood. You know, okay. All right. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. The whole valley, huh? Yeah. It's <laughs> scary sounding, but when you really think about it, but when you cut a dude's head off, People think they're like, oh, that's 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 horrible. That's, <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> that's when people really started paying attention to ISIS. Is when they started doing those really high produced, you know, torture videos, burning people alive, throwing people in pools and cages yeah. and shit. That's when people were like, wait, we should probably take care of this. This isn't a good thing, you know. Like, yeah, that's that's horrible. Let's stop that. You know, and that to their own demise, man. Right? You go too far, the rest of the world's like, okay, all right, I, even if I did care about your struggle, now I don't because you're just a barbaric animal. Fuck, even even Al Qaeda was calling ISIS barbarians for the shit they were doing. <laughs> Those guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, when you you know when you're Al, Al Qaeda is saying you've taken a little too far, you know, man. 
What? How long were you in Somalia after that? How much longer were you there for? Oh God, I used to know these dates. Um, I think we left <clears throat> maybe before October was over. So a few more weeks in. Yeah, I know. A squadron came in, relieved us. We did a little overlap. We did some rehearsals together. Um, and then we packed up and left. We we just didn't have the people. Mm-hmm. And so, and they didn't need us to stay. I doubt they were going to do anything. I don't even think they stayed much longer after we left, too. I think everything pulled out. Adid, you know, we're flying Adid around now, negotiating again. So everybody's pissed off. And then, you know, when the Afghanistan thing happened, everybody's pissed off again. I'm like, been through this one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's what we do in the military, man. We reach out and smack shit and then we stop and then politicians come back in, hopefully after we're done and say, now do you want to talk? You know, but when they do it at the same time, we're fighting. It doesn't work. But I'd seen that before. We're flying around the guy we were going after in our own aircraft. You know, that's that's just part of the game, I guess. It's crazy. It's a crazy world, man. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that part of the world can ever see peace? Not while I'm alive. Uh, Not in my time. It's, it's, it's not ever been in my time or before. Um, I don't even, I I quit following. I don't even know if they have a government anymore. Is it, are the Kenyans running it? I mean, it's just, it's still the same thing. It's a lawless government. I think they can't get their shit together in the fact that they don't trust each other. Um, when you, and sadly, it feels like where we're headed when, when you create enough doubt, True or not, when you, when you create enough doubt, you lose that trust. Someone's when your government or, or your leaders or somebody says something, and you're always wondering if it's true. Mm-hmm. Then then you have issues in trust, and then when they start taking your food, and you're in a nation that doesn't have you know infrastructure anymore because you've been destroying it for hundreds of years, how do you get back from that, man? How do you how do you get back from the corruption of people stealing all the money? You send them millions of dollars. Where'd it go? Where did it go in a concrete building, dirt street city? Where where does that money go? You know. So they're just kind of destined, I think, to live that way. They, they, they can't get enough people together to run anything. You know, you get 10 people over here and you got a leader. Okay, well, you got 10 people over here and another leader. It's like these clans yeah. can't, can't get big enough to have a, a united government to do one thing, it seems. And I don't think they can get over, like, old tribal disputes, you know? Wow. It's like they don't get over stuff. Yep. No. It's like There's a lifelong no blood... <laughs> No forgiveness over there. For sure. What kind of lessons did you guys, did Delta carry away from that operation? What changes, were there changes made and, and how like, you know, prepping speed, well, we call them speed balls was a a resupply where it was like, you know, a packaged resupply that could just be kicked out of a helicopter. Is that the kind of changes you guys saw? Yeah. We got speed balls now. (laughs) We talked about how to take down.